Welcome to The Reality Show. I'm your host, Ryan Kopinski, and today we are talking about the new Apple Vision Pro. It is finally here. Who that was an exciting WWDC. Um, so many Apple engineers, designers, you know, everyone at Apple works so hard for this. And so I'm excited to talk about it today. Now, we're going to start off with essentially my initial thoughts, and then we'll do a deep dive into the hardware um, of this device. There's going to be two more episodes following, one focusing on the software, um, uh, the Vision OS software, and the spatial apps associated with that. And then another one focused on interesting use cases that Apple has presented, but also that I you know, have thought of in the past 24 hours. So I got into mixed reality or really spatial computing as Apple likes to call it. Um, I would say 10 years ago with the start of Google or with the launch of Google Glass. And that's obviously not necessarily a full, you know, mixed reality or really augmented reality. But that was the first device that I essentially bought um, to enter the, the era of spatial computing. Obviously, that's a huge leap now that we have the Vision Pro. Uh, but I started with Google Glass. Then I did Microsoft HoloLens 1 when it first came out. I also had an HTC Vive, like the original OG uh, Vive headset. And then I think I got a few more headsets. Uh, the Quest Pro I've recently tried, but I just returned because um, it was not quite what I was looking for um, in terms of the mixed reality uh, features. And now we have the Vision Pro. And I think for the first time, uh, we've had a device that delivers on the promise of spatial computing. I literally cried yesterday during the announcement uh, watching it because, you know, I've waited so long for this. I've, I've, I started reading rumors, I think, in 2016 or 2017 about this headset, and it kept getting delayed. Obviously, you know, we had a pandemic and a lot of people had to work from home. So it's a lot it's a lot more difficult for Apple to you know, develop such a secret device uh, when everyone's working from home. So no blame to Apple, but it is finally here. And I am incredibly excited to talk about it. Um, we're going to essentially chat about the hardware and, and then make sure to subscribe uh, on YouTube if you're watching this or anywhere you get your podcasts, uh, because there are going to be many episodes after this doing deep dives into this headset, how it works. If you're a creator or a, a developer, how you can take advantage of it. If you're a company or a startup, you know, the business opportunities. So this is the podcast for everything Apple uh, Vision Pro. And obviously, as Vision becomes a product category, I'm sure there's going to be a Vision Air, maybe a Vision Mini for kids. Um, but this is, this is going to be the podcast for you. So subscribe everywhere you get your podcasts. Um, and if you're watching this or if you're listening to the audio version of this, this might be a great episode to watch the YouTube video of because I'm going to show some footage of the headset. I will do my utmost best to make sure to also describe any visuals I, uh, I show. So let's get into it. And by the way, I have my laptop in front of me. So if I look down, I apologize, but I have essentially, you know, my notes and some pictures and videos on my laptop, but I'll also show them. Uh, on screen here and I will also describe them for all our audio listeners. So let's get into it. So this is the Vision Pro. I think it looks absolutely beautiful. Um, it still looks a little bit bulky but I think when you have so much, so much technology in such a headset um, I don't think it can be as small and compact and, and light as my for example my prescription glasses. I think that's maybe going to be in five to seven years from now. I, I know Apple's working on that. And I think the future vision is to have an augmented re reality or spatial computer that looks like my glasses, but we're just not there with battery technology, optics, displays. There's too much not yet solved for a, a device like that. Many of us, I think, in especially in the mainstream uh, consumer area, expect that something may be a little bit smaller and for sure cheaper. Um, but this is the first product in this new category that's going to spawn a completely new industry. It's really interesting, actually. So spatial computing, for those of you that haven't really uh, thought too much about spatial computing or have, have experience in it, spatial computing is really interesting because if you think about it, we live in 3D, right? We're living in an XYZ world. Um, and our digital worlds, uh, whether that's shopping on Amazon or watching content on YouTube, they're vast spaces. 
but they're always access through a 2d window a very narrow small six inch seven inch whatever sometimes even a 16 inch macbook pro but it is always limited by a 2d window and this is i think an, a new era for spatial computing where our computers are going to coexist in our spaces alongside us and we're going to be able to tap into 3d digital spaces and merge them with ours or completely immerse our, ourselves in fictional completely you know uh, virtual spaces and so this is a new era I, I don't think Apple is exaggerating because sometimes their marketing is a little bit over the top but I think this is right on the money this is a new era for computing and you know as a geek as a maker as a content creator this is so exciting to me um, I hope you are excited as well so the headset let's talk about the components that it has and i'm going to try to explain how things work but really if there's anything you come away with from this podcast episode i want you to like understand why things matter or why things were designed a certain way um, because i think the why and the how are way more exciting than just specs you know the what um, but let's get started so when you see someone wearing this headset what you're going to see is essentially a glass enclosure so it's a one piece of glass that is molded and shaped in 3d it's really beautiful um, and it's polished in a way where because there's cameras behind the glass and there's also a display behind the glass so if you had something that was opaque you wouldn't be able to use the sensors and the cameras and there's a lot of those um, so this almost has to be like a lens from iPhone so this thing here like one of these lenses it's almost like that, but just a ginormous one piece of glass. Um, to me, it's it's interesting, um, but it's, it also makes me a little bit scared for scratching it or dropping it. So if you're going to get this device, um, which it ships next year, early next year, I'm guessing January, uh, make sure you have Apple Care or some type of case or be very careful because to fix that piece of glass is going to be, it's going to be expensive. Um, so yeah, just make sure that you're careful with this device. Around this is essentially like an aluminum casing. I think it's an aluminum alloy. I think it's probably a, uh, some type of aircraft grade uh, alloy that essentially houses all the compute modules, all the sensors. And that's probably the, the strongest component of the headset that needs to protect you know, the very sensitive and expensive electronics. Now, inside of this enclosure, obviously, is a lot of tech. Uh, Apple mentioned it was 5,000 patents over, I think, a span of 10 years that went into developing this device. So this is not a joke. Um, I believe there's, I mean, there's obviously a lot of cameras and sensors in here because you're essentially wearing almost like a fully enclosed uh, ski goggles, right? Imagine if you couldn't see through ski goggles, but now these cameras have to take out, take the outside world and pass it through video onto the displays of this headset. And that's what's called pass through mixed reality or pass through augmented reality. And so these sensors are very sophisticated. Um, if I'm not mistaken, during the keynote, I think they mentioned that there's 12 cameras, which is, I mean, iPhone Pro Max has three <laughs> and one LiDAR, and this has an enormous amount of cameras. So on the front, I think up top, you know, on, on the bottom too, to be able to see, you know, your hands if you're making gestures uh, that work with the vision uh, operating system. And so it's a very sophisticated uh, array of sensors. Now there's also LiDAR. So for those of you that have an iPhone uh, Pro, you have probably used LiDAR before, even if you weren't aware of it. So LiDAR is essentially a depth sensor that sends out a bunch of uh, signals to measure depth in the scene. So it can reconstruct your whole environment. So it can know, for example, there's a bed or a table or a window or wall. And it has all these dots that reconstruct um, your environment. So now the computer understands your space. That's really useful because it can personalize it. It can essentially place objects or content or you know windows for apps. 
So it has a spatial understanding and also a semantic understanding because it knows what type of ob objects are in your space, like a chair or a table. This, is, this was on iPhone, but quite frankly, I don't think we really needed a LiDAR sensor iPhone, but Apple needed to see the ecosystem with LiDAR apps. They needed it to make developers aware and um, really experts at augmented reality without revealing the headset. And so a lot of the technology that Apple has released over the past few years are really, um, they were really meant for this headset, really to just uh, test things and validate ideas. Um, and the headset also has, I think, what's called IR uh, flood illuminators or blasters, where if you're in a dark environment, the cameras can still see things like hands and gestures. So this headset really would work in daylight conditions, but also, you know, in, in at night, I think. We'll have to see once we get our hands on it. Um, but it's really interesting. I don't know. I haven't seen any... Um, uh, Apple marketing materials that suggest this could be used outdoors or out and about, but I'm I'm gonna try it and whenever I have it, I'll post a video about my experiences, you know, trying all uh, a variety of things. I'll even go to a, this will be a, in a safe way, but I'll try to drive with it and see how responsive it is if you can actually drive. Now this will be in a controlled environment, um, but exciting things ahead. So those are the sensors, right? So you have the enclosures, the sensors, now, why would you need all of that, right? You really want to essentially capture the surrounding environments and bring it into displays. And the displays are incredible. Not all the specs are available, but the displays are made up of micro OLED displays, which are, they're really tiny displays. Essentially, Apple mentioned they are uh, almost post stamp size. So very small, I think probably about an inch wide. And they're likely square. Um, but it's a micro OLED displays. And the reason why micro OLED matters is because the pixels are individually lit as opposed to having a backlight. Why does that matter? Well, OLED displays have almost infinite contrast ratios. The black are actually black and they can show really pretty highlights. The colors are beautifully saturated. It's just a great display technology. Now, LCD technologies, which is another display technology, has caught up with mini LED and local dimming. Um, but OLED, I think, is still the most beautiful display uh, I've seen. If you haven't seen an OLED yet, well, most iPhones actually now have OLED displays. But go to a tech store um, nearby, Best Buy or whatever, and look at OLED TVs and then compare it to an LCD TV. It's, it's a very stark um, difference especially the really good ones. So these are micro OLED displays and they are more than 4K per eye. So most TVs now are 4K. Imagine that for each eye in such a small um, display. It's like an inch wide, I think. That's very, very high resolution or pixel density. Um, and you need that because the displays are very close. If you had lower resolution, you'd see pixels, you'd see display artifacts. From the people, the media that was at an event and has tried it, they said it's probably the best display they've ever seen in a headset like this. And I will wholeheartedly believe them because if you have 4K per eye or a little bit more, that means you have 8K combined. Um, 8K is a very high resolution. Um, and so, super stoked to see you know to try this in real life hopefully you know i get to see a demo unit uh, this summer and i will report anything i'm obviously allowed to report uh, back to you in this podcast but the displays are absolutely stunning now if you just had a very small display or even try to do your iphone and look at a display you would know that you can't really see a virtual world it would just not you would just see a display and so to essentially immerse you into this headset, there's lenses or essentially the optics. And Apple made a very compact um, custom design. I think it's a three lens or three element uh, lens. And it, it's probably what people in the industry would call pancake optics, right? You usually have f the, the cheaper headsets or the older headsets have what's called Fresnel lenses. Those are very thick. Uh, tend to be pretty heavy, uh, bulky especially. That's why headsets used to be that, you know, front heavy and bulky in the front because they had, you know, optics that were very big. Um, and this is very compact. 
combined with the beautiful displays, uh, it's going to it's going to result in an amazing and stunning experience every time you wear this headset. Okay, working our way into the, essentially into the enclosure, Apple is also using eye tracking and they have a bunch of sensors on the inside to track your eyes. Now, why would they want to track your eyes? Well, a big part of Vision OS, the operating system uh, that the headset will use, is using essentially your gaze to know where you're looking. So that's essentially like a mouse pointer. You know, the, the Mac had the mouse, iPhone had multi-touch, and the new headset essentially has eye, gesture, so hand, and voice. So very natural. Um, people in the mixed reality space would call this a, a very natural uh, interface or an intuitive interface because it uses things that humans already do in 3D space. So it's very natural to do that in mixed reality or augmented reality space. So it has a lot of uh, eye tracking sensors. Now, because of that, and because of the compactness of the enclosure, you won't be able to wear glasses in it. Um, I have pretty big glasses, so I, I usually struggle anyway, even if the headset it has room for glasses. Uh, but what they did, I think is also very, uh, it's, it's gonna result in a great user experience, although it's gonna be a little bit expensive. They are partnering with Zeiss, and if you're not familiar with Zeiss, they make really amazing camera lenses, but also lenses for other things and glass and filters. And so these, these essentially magnetic inserts will have your custom prescription if you wear glasses, um, and they will essentially align through magnets in the headset. I also like that because that's actually essentially protecting the sensitive and really expensive lenses of the actual headset. So I love these inserts. You can obviously wear contact lenses, but this would allow you to have a very compact solution of personalized Vision Pro just for you and your prescription. Um, and this will not degrade quality um, of, of the display. And one thing too, you know, I have glasses and there, you can see there's a little bit of a glare because I'm facing a window in a hotel. Um, some glasses have anti-reflective coatings, some better than others. Uh, but if you're wearing glasses, it, the glare would mess with the eye tracking. So they have created custom optics that have special coatings to minimize any glare and to calibrate the sensors so the eye tracking still works because that's a huge part of using the device. So you have to make sure um, that you know the eye tracking works because it's part of the, the, the user experience. All of this, right? All these displays, all these cameras, all these sensors, the LiDAR, the IR, all of this, it's a lot of data. I mean, it's 8K video, 12 cameras, LiDAR sensors, IR sensors, eye tracking. You need a lot of compute power. You can't really use something like, I mean, you, you could use a mobile class processor, something that, you know, for example, Qualcomm, uh, makes for Android phones and they port it essentially what's called the XR2. So the XR2 Qualcomm chip is what um, Qualcomm makes for devices like the Quest. So if you've ever tried a MetaQuest 2 or Quest Pro, those are made by Qualcomm. But those are mobile level chips. Apple is actually using a new architecture for a dual chip setup. And if you've heard of Apple Silicon, my God, are they fast. I have an M1 uh, Max in my MacBook Pro and an M1 Ultra in my Mac Studio, they are ridiculously fast. And this one has an M2 chip. So that's their, their latest Apple Silicon. And these chips are ridiculously fast and they're desktop class, so not mobile class uh, chipsets. So the performance for this headset, I feel like Apple just has prepared in public really because they they launched apple silicon i think two years ago at wwdc but this was really these processes really are going to shine in the vision platform because it requires sustained performance um, for as long as people use this headset now the m2 chip that's one of two chips in this headset is essentially for general computing processing you know computing tasks the, the user interface and all that they have a custom dedicated high performance R1 chip. That's probably called a reality one chip. They, they, they didn't say that, but I think it's a reality chip. And that processes all the sensor data in real time so that you can get 
you know you can get a scene understanding the computer knows your your surroundings and can respond to it in real time so those two processes are talking together obviously millions times per second um, to process all the data and show you everything you know in real time without any or very little latency I believe the latency in the displays is like 12 milliseconds that's that's faster than I blink so it is incredibly fast um, but I, I hope you kind of get an idea of why this device is so powerful but also expensive because you're wearing essentially a MacBook that has way more cameras than any MacBook ever has even than any iPhone ever has and it's an 8k display I don't think Apple offers any 8k display combined at least um, in any of their products the fanciest display they have the pro display XDR is I think 6k and it's close to six thousand dollars with the optional stand so this device is starting thirty five hundred dollars excluding the you know prescription lenses and, and maybe optional accessories um, but quite frankly this is not an expensive device relatively speaking it is a lot of money and for people that for example buy you know an iPhone SE or a MacBook Air and their students or you know maybe some some older people that just want an iPad as a computer for, for those people it is very expensive and I wouldn't recommend them buying it uh, because it's not really yet a consumer device this is more of a production device for content creators developers companies to create and spawn a new ecosystem so that when cheaper vision uh, headsets come out or computers there's so many apps there's an app for everything there's amazing content very immersive content so that's essentially just a little bit on the price when you have all that processing going on essentially a MacBook on your face you need it to stay cool because if it gets hot it's gonna get hot on your face and being sweaty in a device like this is not great and it can also maybe even damage it I'm pretty sure they have a proper uh, protection for that but you don't want your face getting hot um, and so it has obviously if you've ever had a MacBook or you know any type of Apple computer you know their current cooling systems are state-of-the-art and I, I expect no less in this so they have like these vents on the bottom so that air and also vents on top I believe it sucks from the top and then blows to the bottom now on the top right of the headset there's like this button a, a, a rotary dial what they refer to as a digital crown now if you have ever seen an Apple watch or an AirPods Max headphone there's this rotary button that clicks but also rotates um, it's really it's a nifty design uh, concept that this device also has it and when you tap on it you essentially get what's called the home view of vision OS you see all your apps similar to when you would press or wake up an iPhone um, or when you would press that on an Apple watch so again Apple tries to make sure people in the ecosystem have a uni like you know a uniform and a delightful experience uh, so that's really cool and when you rotate it so this is really cool and I've never seen this before and I don't think people understand how amazing this actually is so this is predominantly a augmented reality device you should be able to see your surroundings the people in the environment um, but this DAO can actually like almost like a slider to to change how much of the real world or a virtual you want to see so there's these things called environments where Apple has volumetrically captured like a beautiful lake landscape and normally it's just a little bit to just just immerse you just a little bit but as you're rotating this dial it'll show more of the environment to essentially fully immersing you in this environment which is essentially what you would think of as a virtual reality experience right so if you've ever tried VR it can go all the way from AR to VR in these environments my god that's such a novel concept and it's typical Apple to be able to you know come up with this and then execute it at the level that it is it's such an interesting concept where you can essentially dial in your immersion so if you want to be completely you know immersed in a space you want to escape the, the real world you can or you can do it a little bit or not at all um, I love it I love it so much and on the left of the headset so this headset doesn't have a lot of buttons but on the left of this headset is a normal button a button that you can expect like a power button or a volume button on an iPhone and that one actually takes spatial photos and videos 
So this headset obviously has a lot of cameras. And because it is a spatial computer, it can actually capture spatial video and photos. So Vision OS supports this new a way of capturing memories in a spatial format. I don't know too much about it yet because the information is still sparse, but it looks really, really cool. But yeah, very exciting to see, you know, this industrial design. This is, this is, I think, a beautiful headset. It still looks pretty quirky and, and geeky, but for a first iteration, I don't think I would have done anything differently. And I am a very picky person. Ask any of my friends. It's a beautiful device. Now, let's talk about wearing this device because obviously it's going to be on your face. So how does it sit comfortably and tight but not overly tight on your face? So the first thing is a light seal. So that's essentially what presses against your face and holds the headset and aligns the headset essentially with your vision so you can see in it and you know be immersed in this uh, augmented reality world. So they have a light seal. Apparently, there's multiple, that they have a variety of shapes and sizes, and it also flexes and molds around your face. So it's kind of like a watch where Apple has a variety of bands and materials. This is essentially something similar where you will likely have to use an iPhone to scan your face or go to an Apple store for a fitting to get the ideal fit. Because when you're spending close to $4,000 on a device like this, you really want it to fit well uh, so that it doesn't fall off, that it's not overly tight. So the light seal, I think, is brilliant. Now, how can you swap out all these parts? It's, that's because they're using a modular system. So everything essentially comes apart except obviously their closure and you can adjust things to, to have a very comfortable fit. Now, moving on to the band, right? The things, that, the, the essentially, the, the headband that will hold it on uh, to your face. That's also made up of modular parts. So there's two parts. One are the audio straps. So the first piece that is attached to the actual headset is like, it looks like a silicone based uh, material, something soft to the touch, but still pretty rigid. And it contains spatial audio drivers. So it has essentially speakers on the, 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 the left and right side and this is apparently Apple's most advanced spatial audio uh, system. Now, if you've ever tried AirPods, it's pretty remarkable what they can do. Y you can essentially have the audio play from the source where it is, or it can be spatialized. It's really interesting, especially for music that has been remastered or mastered for Dolby Atmos. That's the spatial technology. But this is even a higher level where it makes it, because these speakers are not in your ear, they're by your ear and are directing the audio to your ear. But the fascinating thing about that is, is it can behave acoustically accurate to the room that you're in. So it essentially all, almost, it's called audio raycasting. It sends essentially signals or senses the environment and the way audio would reverb or bounce or uh, diffuse in a space, you know, the acoustic properties of the space, it tries to respect those. So it feels like you're extra immersed, you know, in your current space um, while content or experiences are ongoing. I mean, the technology, in, so maybe maybe at this point, you, you'll probably start to realize why this initial headset is so expensive, how much, you know, money went into this R&D. Um, but the audio is going to be huge because if you've ever been to like an IMAX theater or really any movie theater, when they have amazing audio and sound effects and music, it feels like you're actually there. Imagine being in a virtual space or in your living room and having an IMAX experience. I mean, I'm getting chills just thinking about it, right? So this is so exciting. Um, so those are the audio straps. Now, the thing that holds you in the back is it looks very comfortable. Um, it's probably made out of some type of fabric. I don't know the type of fabric, but it's what's called 3D woven. So it is essentially what Apple is saying is it provides cushioning because there's all these like ridges essentially. It provides cushioning, breathability, and stretch. So everyone I've shown this headset to, uh, family, friends, they all say it looks comfortable. None of them really said it looks pretty, but I don't think Apple tried to make it pretty. Apple tries to make things iconic and comfortable because it's all about the user experience. So this stretchy back support um, looks very comfortable. And there's also 
on that strap, so on the right side of the strap, is essentially a dial that allows you to make micro adjustments so you can have the ideal fit um, for your face or maybe the type of experience you're doing. Maybe you're doing fitness or something and you want it a little bit tighter, that dial can essentially do that. Now, this, even this headband will also come in different sizes. So I saw a picture where it says M. So I'm guessing there's going to be a small M, large maybe. I'm sure third parties and maybe Apple will also create different types of headbands. So I think the spatial audio, uh, the, the, the audio headband is probably going to be the same, but the back one is going to be different. Now, in my previous podcast episode, if you listened, you also heard me ask or wish for a top strap. And apparently, Apple will have an optional top strap because, you know, this device doesn't look as, as heavy as some other headsets out there. It's pretty compact, but it still weighs down on your face. And if you have a top strap, it relieves pressure on your face. And that makes it just much more comfortable to use, you know, for hours on end. So I think with the headband, why does this matter? Apple, again, is prioritizing comfort, user experience. This is going to be a device that is really personal. I think the most personal device they've ever made because it's on your face. And they've treated it with the respect that you'd expect from a device like that. And then for the final thing about this headset is how do you power it? Because you, you didn't hear me say, for example, that there's a battery built into the enclosure, right? The glass and aluminum enclosure. The battery is external. And it has essentially a magnetic locking mechanism on the left side of the headset. And it allows you to essentially lock in a external battery pack. Now, this external battery pack essentially looks like a pretty thick iPhone. It's just like a anodized aluminum brick, so to speak. So it's a battery pack. Um, it's proprietary. And the cable does not uh, remove from the battery side. So it's you're going to have to use Apple proprietary battery packs. Uh, but it's essentially uh, spec to be two hours of usage, of consistent usage. Now, you might ask, okay, two hours, what if I want to use it for work? Um, you know, work days are still eight hours or even longer for some people. Um, and there will be likely a outlet Mac safe connector too. So where you essentially like a MacBook where you have battery or power. This is very much like a Mac. Um, there will likely also be where you plug it into the outlet. Now, you have to be careful not to walk up, you know, or, or get up and walk and just pull it out of the, you know, the outlet. Um, but if you want it to be mobile or you want to just chill after a long day of work and be immersed in your own, very own IMAX theater at home, uh, you can use the battery. I'm sure they'll sell additional batteries for, for a price. Obviously, it's going to be pretty price. It's probably going to be $299 or $399. Um, or you can do it in an AC outlet if you're stationary at a desk and you're just using it like a Mac. Um, but that's essentially, you know, the hardware of the Apple Vision Pro. But this is essentially a standalone, high performance, high fidelity, mixed reality device. And we have never seen this before. And for the price, I actually think Apple is not charging their so-called Apple tax, where things are a little bit pricier than you know the competition. This seems like a fairly priced, state-of-the-art, spatial computer that will usher us into the, a new era for technology. It is still expensive in an absolute sense, and I don't think consumers should get it yet unless they have you know a lot of discretionary income. But this is going to be the start of really, and Apple said this, it's the start of a new era. And I am so incredibly excited for this moment. Um, this is history. You know, we're witnessing history in computing. And it, I think it's a beautiful moment. I'm so thankful for Apple for creating this. And I want to say, good job. This is, this is what we need for mixed reality, augmented reality, spatial computing, and even VR. They didn't mention the word VR. But this is the best headset I've ever seen. Um, and I'm so excited to get my hands on one um, and make content about it. Obviously, every single week, there will be a new podcast episode uh, sharing my thoughts, new, you know, new ideas, and things I learn along the way about this headset. So again, if you've made it all the way to the end, thank you so much. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave a goggles emoji in the comments so I know you made it to the end. I appreciate all of you. This is going to be an exciting uh, year or years to come for Vision Platform. Uh, and thanks for watching and listening.